Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president here, and I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon. We have a truly overflow crowd. We're not only jammed in this room, but there's a whole other room that is filled, which I think is a testimony to the importance of this topic. I heard several people say, great to see you here in the States, so I'm also glad to be able to bring uh, all these Mali uh, fans together. Um, uh, USIP, for those who haven't been here before, was tasked by Congress 30 years ago to develop practical approaches to resolving, uh, preventing, and managing conflict. And we do that by bringing together practical tools, field work, research, training, and policy recommendations. Um, and th I think the reason that there are so many people here in this room is the eager and enthusiastic hope that we can bring to bear practical peace-building tools in a place like Mali. Um, and the fact that Mali is in this very specific transition period, uh, uh, which is when we really want to pay very close attention. Um, I was just uh, talking with Ambassador Leonard, who I last saw in Mali in 2012, which she tells me is the longest year Mali's ever had. Um, and uh, I was there at a time when there was still a lot of head scratching going on as to how did this uh, model democracy of West Africa suddenly just implode with the coup and then everything that happened in the North. Um, and uh, we also have going on today day three of the World Bank Fragility Forum. And I see some of you here who we were wandering around there earlier this week. You know, and I think Mali really represents the classic challenge of understanding how fragility is both a national security threat for a country and it's a global security threat. Um, and we need to understand how these forces of democracy development and security really work together um, and take deep and clear-eyed looks at how to support countries and regions as they seek to move out of fragility. And some miscalculations that were done in Mali that are still being thought about and, and people are seeking to understand. So we're here today in part because we have the transition of the OTI program, and I'm pleased to see some of my former OTI colleagues here um, and AID colleagues. Uh, it's, um, and, and it's an interesting time because we do have the peace deal. We had elections. Uh, the OTI program was very much focused on trying to create positive conditions for both of those to happen. So congratulations uh, on the contribution to that. We also know that peace deals often fail in the first five years, and we're just coming up on the first year. So now is really the time that we need to be fully focused on what's next for Mali. How can Mali can continue to steer itself forward at a time where there is still conflict? It's in a really tough neighborhood, and there's a lot of, of hope um, and a lot of need to help Mali succeed in a positive transition. So I'm delighted um, that we're able to be here today for this conversation, and I'm also very delighted to now introduce the moderator for today's panel, who is uh, uh, a good friend and close colleague, both from USIP and AID, and USIP before that, um, Beth Cole, who is our special advisor on countering violent extremism and conflict uh, here at USIP, previously ran the USAID Office on Civil-Military Cooperation, and has a very long career um, in thinking and uh, writing and working on these issues. So please join me in welcoming Beth Cole. Thank you, Nancy. And who said we couldn't fill this room uh, on Mali? I don't know. We're going to have to talk to them. Um, so I just want you to know that uh, we're not the only people that are watching this event. We have many people in an overflow room and many people that are streaming this as well. Um, and for those of you in the Twitter universe, please join us at hashtag USIP Mali. Um, 
You know, we don't often stop and pause to think about um, places like Mali um, that are going through some very difficult transitions and to really uh, try to bring on board some of the lessons and some of the things that we might have done well to build peace, but also to examine some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that lie ahead. And so today we're very fortunate to have really an all-star cast up here uh, to help us both look at the lessons, but also to look ahead to challenges and opportunities. Um, I want to just start with uh, Kamisa Kamara. 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 Uh, I practice. Um, Kamisa um, is the uh, senior program officer for, for West and Central Africa at, at the NED. Um, she also started the program for Mali at the NED. Um, and what, something that I just learned is that she's the founder and co-chair of the Sahel Strategy Forum, which brings together a wide array of stakeholders um, to look at, uh, look at issues in the Sahel. Um, ambassador Mary Beth Leonard, who Nancy kind of just also introduced, um, was uh, the ambassador in Mali uh, during these very difficult years of transition from November 2011 uh, to September 2014. Um, and because of that work, um, she received the State Department's Diplomacy for Human Rights Award in 2013. And when I asked her yesterday if that goes to a bunch of ambassadors, she said, no, actually just one. One per year. So that really says something uh, about her service. Um, Joel Hurst. Joel Hurst was the USAID OTI country representative in Mali. Uh, he just left in December, and he was there from 2013 to 2016. Uh, previous, he was the uh, country representative for OTI uh, in Uganda um, and acting in Venezuela. And if you think you don't get rewarded for these assignments, just take a look, because Joel's headed to northern Nigeria uh, to be that <laughs> acting representative uh, or the representative for OTI. Um, so we, uh, we're going to start with a Kamisa, and we're going to roll through, and then we're going to open it up uh, to invite all of you to join our conversation. Kamisa. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to USIP for um, having me here. Um, I was asked to summarize what has happened uh, in Mali since uh, 2012, and it is quite a difficult task to do that, uh, because every single step that has been taken in Mali since 2012, every single event that has occurred in the country has had huge impacts in Mali, but also in the entire um, Sahel region. Um, Back in 2012, the National Endowment for Democracy realized that it had not had a program in Mali for a very long time, and that may be because the military coup, uh, which took place that same year, was a surprise. Um, a funding program to civil society organizations could be helpful in addressing some of the underlying governance issues um, that not many outside of Mali were aware of. So uh, NED, along with um, some other international organizations and the international community, were shocked that a beacon of democracy such as Mali could have problems. Well, it did, um, and Mali remains uh, a democracy nonetheless. Um, what is important to uh, recognize here is that Mali has come a very long way since 2012. Well, 2012 was an eventful year. Uh, there was a military coup. At the same time, um, there was a rebellion uh, raging in, in the northern part of the country. Uh, in early 2013, the French uh, slash ECOWAS military intervention uh, was able to liberate northern Mali from the jihadists who had temporarily sidelined uh, the separatist rebels. And uh, the same year, Mali held successful legislative elections and um, elected uh, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita as uh, president of the country. Uh, in 2015, um, I think that the most important event that occurred, at least from an international perspective, is the signature of the Algiers Accord, the Algiers Peace Agreement. Um, that officially put an end to the fourth Tuareg rebellion that Mali has known uh, since it gained independence from the French um, in 1960. The um, uh, Algiers peace agreement came after very long months of tense negotiations between the Malian government and some Arab and Tuareg factions who were having some, um, I would say, difficulties in, in agreeing on a negotiation strategy. Some were adamant that uh, they wanted an independent state in northern Mali. 
some were not. Um, at the end of the day, it didn't really matter because the Malian government wasn't even willing to entertain uh, the idea of an independent state in the north. So um, about the peace agreement, I think that um, uh, looking at, at Mali's issues since 2012, it is important to remember that Mali's uh, security and political uh, crisis are multidimensional, which makes the implementation of the Al Jazeera Accord extremely difficult. Not impossible, but extremely um, uh, difficult. So I would like to maybe highlight a few points here that could help us really get the whole picture of what has been happening in the country uh, since 2012. So the 2012 Tariq Rebellion took place um, in a context of constantly evolving power struggles between more and more powerful non-state actors um, in northern Mali. And um, one of the reasons why the rebels were able to take over two-thirds of, of um, northern Mali was because they had received uh, top-notch military training um, in Gaddafi's Libya, and they had come back to Mali with uh, sophisticated weapons, which they owned and uh, which they could use. One other thing that I would like to highlight, and sometimes um, this is totally overlooked, some of the Tuareg fighters who came back from Libya were joined by other rebels that were not necessarily uh, Tuaregs, who had deserted the Malian army several times. So they were basically fighting a military or an army um, of which they were a part of uh, a few months earlier. And this is very important to, to remember. What is worrying after all of this money that has been poured um, into Mali since 2012 um, is the, the fact that um, there was this small arms survey uh, that came out uh, last year that came up with the conclusion that the jihadists and some of the rebel factions in northern Mali were more armed than the Malian military still today, which is very worrying. Uh, I want to believe that this is not true, um, but if it is, um, then we have a, a serious uh, problem that we have to deal with. So this brings me to my main point. Um, I think it is important to know how much uh, President Ibeka spent when he bought that plane, but what is more important, I think, is to figure out how Mali, as a country, will implement that huge clause, which is, I think, key central to uh, Mali's stability within the next 20 years, and that is the demobilization, demilitarization, and reintegration process. When we're talking about combatants or uh, former rebels, how do you reintegrate them into uh, Malian society? Uh, do you reintegrate them in the Malian civil service? Do you reintegrate them into um, the army? Mali has had a series of failed attempts since the 1990s, and uh, I've met a few Malian uh, officials over the past three years who've told me that, well, if without the DDR process or without reintegration, there is no peace possible. Well, okay, but um, how do you deal with these rebels who have deserted the Malian army multiple times, who are not necessarily loyal to uh, the Malian government, and who uh, have an allegiance to this virtual state uh, called Azawad? I think that's a, a big question that I'm asking everybody here. So while a successful uh, DDR process will um, ensure the long-term stability of, of Mali, will ensure the state's uh, monopoly of force. It is also important to recognize that illicit trafficking and organized crime in northern Mali and in the Sahel have provided a stable income to uh, some rebel factions or jihadists in northern Mali. So what does that provide them? Uh, it gives them prestige, it gives them power, it gives them money, which are perks that I don't believe that the Malian government could uh, rival, and this is, this is a problem. For this reason, um, Mali's challenge is to integrate uh, former rebels into the civil service and into the military has never been as complex as it is, as it is today. It was complex in the 1990s, but it is extremely uh, complex uh, today because of the reasons I just mentioned. 
As a consequence, um, the signing of the peace agreement um, last year is one very small step toward uh, national reconciliation and long-term uh, peace in uh, Mali, who's, who, which is a country, I think, uh, whose stability will really determine the stability of the entire um, Sahel region. In my opinion, peace prospects in Mali offer a very limited number of possibilities, and that is because of the radically opposed expectations of the northern rebels uh, from those of the Malian government when it comes to the issue of autonomy or an independent state um, in northern Mali. And I'm using this platform to, this platform to remind um, everybody that this issue of an independent state or this issue of Azawa did not start in 2012. Even before Mali gained independence from France, the um, idea of an independent state in northern Mali, this idea of an Azawa state was mentioned uh, in the 1950s, I can't remember the year, by a historian called Mohamed El Midi Ag Atayer. So even before Mali gained independence from the French, this idea of an independent state was already there. So again, um, this it wasn't the first time that we've heard of it in 2012, and it is important to look back at Mali's history to really understand um, uh, where we've, we've come. Also, um, one other complication uh, ar around this issue of autonomy and, and uh, in, in dealing with, with rebels um, in northern Mali is that the rebels who took up arms against the Malian government are a minority within a minority. They do not represent the entire Tuareg community. They do not represent the entire Arab commu community. They do not certainly represent the Malian community. Uh, they only represent themselves. And this is very important to keep in mind. To conclude on a positive note, most uh, <laughs> civil society organizations that we, the NED, um, have been supporting over the, the, the past uh, three years have had very innovative approaches in, in dealing with some of the governance issues that I've just um, mentioned. Some are engaging the military by building um, civil military platforms. Some are engaging the media in training them in ICTs to uh, monitor public policies and parliament sessions. Um, some women's groups are training uh, other women in northern Mali in public speaking, uh, in how to run political campaigns. Uh, some dynamic, very active youth groups are um, engaging the elders on accountability issues and on how to manage um, uh, public accounts or, or budgets. Mm -hmm. So as a conclusion, um, I would say that if the, the 2012 military coup did anything in Mali and also uh, um, in, in terms of the diaspora, the Malian diaspora that are here in the U.S. or in France, is that it really managed for, for, for Mali to um, make Malians, uh, again, both in Mali and in the diaspora, pay closer attention to what is happening at the highest levels um, of the state. And I, I think that this provides hope for, for the future. Okay. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. And thank you, Kamisa, for a great overview as a backdrop to our discussion. Um, I would, before going into my presentation, which is going to try to talk about what the United States had been doing in Mali and then how that changed because of events and uh, some of the tools that we used through 2013, 2014, and in particular the OTI program as one member of a very engaged international community to help Mali come back uh, from crisis and the abyss uh, and to reestablish itself as a partner not only for us us, but for its partners in the region. The one thing I think I would add to Kambisa's remarks is that when we talk about discussions of uh, Tuareg independence, um, it is not merely the government of Mali who refused that as a condition that is actually was wholly embraced by the international community and obviously is a founding principle of the Organization of African Unity and a very fond fondly held African principle, um, but that was never particularly on the table. And I think that um, if you look at the substance of Tuareg grievances over time, many of them uh, amount to a governance issue of service delivery as opposed to necessarily an attachment to an independent state. That's a long and contentious and complicated conversation. Um, you know, it is true to say that 
governance also fails in northern Mali, which in southern Mali, which has a great deal of needs. It is also true that Segu and Sikasso look very different from Kidal and, and Gao, and there is a difference to what has been accomplished in the north as opposed to the south. But at any rate. So pre the coup in Mali, uh, what was the United States doing there? What was going on there? I'm going to need those glasses, so I'm going to take them. <laughs> So we had this very agreeable place. Uh, you know, Mali was the, uh, had the freest press in Africa, according to Freedom House. It was the only organization of the Islamic Conference country certified as politically free. It was on the verge of having elections to have a second president in a row, depart nicely after his constitutional two terms. Uh, very uh, uh, religiously tolerant, with really rich social mechanisms for conflict resolution. Um, and so it was this very agreeable place that also had a very significant number of challenges. Um, along with its Sahelian neighbors, was has traditionally been in the bottom slots of the Human Development in Index, so very, very poor, uh, a period of drought, um, you know, a serial Tuareg rebellion over the course of its independent history, um, and uh, encro encroaching extremism um, into the north of Mali. So a very agreeable place with some very significant challenges attracted a lot of interest and attention, not only from the United States, but from the entire donor community. And what we were doing there were things in health and education, not only to bring services to the people of Mali, but also with an emphasis on decentralization to sort of help reinforce the contract between a democratically elected government and its people, um, military capacity building, you know, generally the things that go along with um, the U.S. goals in Africa as expressed generally in terms of uh, reinforcing democratic institutions, peace and security, economic growth, opportunity for people. You come to 2012 and you have three unbelievably interwoven crises happening at the same time. Uh, and it's, it's governance and rebellion and extremism. It's a, a nice little mantra. Governance and rebellion and extremism, oh my. And they were all very linked to each other in Mali's downward spiral. If you look at that series of events, you have a resurgence of rebellion in the north, which Mali's military was unable to uh, counter, which led to incredible frustration on, uh, 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 by people, by family members first of the military, uh, who, who objected uh, to the difficult conditions that their loved ones were enduring that led to a mutiny in Bamako. Now we have the crisis of governance where political forces glommed onto that and it became a coup. And then you had, with the disarray in Bamako, people in the north taking advantage and moving into more cities and a faction of Tuareg rebellion that allied itself with extremism to take over the north as a Malian military that was not supported when there was a government slipped away um, in the face of no one able to support them in the midst of the, the political uncertainty that was there. The, as the extremists took over to the north, I think that 2012, the longest year of my life, I think, um, was, was also characterized by extraordinary fluidity, quicksilver shifting of alliances. It was a very, very confused um, time in the north. And then at one point, and one can argue about what the intentions were or what drove them to that, there was the intolerable uh, southward push uh, by the extremists towards the south, towards Bamako, or towards the airport in Mopti, well, whatever. But that was what triggered uh, the French intervention. It was what triggered uh, the eventual entry of a FISMA that became MINUSMA, an international intervention to restore um, the territorial integrity of Mali. So if Mali, if, the, if, if governance and rebellion and extremism were very interwoven in the downward spiral, it was equally true and it was a very firmly held consensus within the international community that unraveling that spiral would need to uh, do, fix those three things as well. So the very first um, emphasis was on getting through a transition, which was devised by ECOWAS to get back to an elected government. You've got to solve a rebellion, but you can't, uh, why would rebels negotiate with a government would, that would not be the entity to implement what it was that they uh, would, would agree to? Uh, so you, that was the, the first cornerstone in that. And you'll hear a bit later about how the uh, U.S. interagency and through some OTI programs that in lockstep with the international community 
help to get back to that point. Um, I think one of the points that reminds you how interlinked these crises were was the fact that the French intervention, as that began to regain territory in Mali's north, really set the, the, the preparations for elections on fire. People were just so ready to be through this transition and to do that, let's get to elections. So the international community sat there and under the leadership of Minusma said, okay, you know, if these people are really gonna have elections on July 28th, the following 28 things had better happen. Which of you can sign up for which parts? And there was a very close coordination uh, to make that happen. Then you have an elected government that can have a negotiation with its disgruntled members. And that was, a, a, although 2013 was a very fast year in my life, it was also a year, and through 2014, in which the international community was very closely supporting not only the individual pre-discussions and the pre-pre-discussions and the sort of almost pre-discussions and then uh, and, and multiple parts of the of the embassy and including some programs uh, from OTI worked on a variety of supports to that process. Which brings you to the third part of the spiral, which is that essential questions like counterterrorism and 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 counter rebellion or counter uh, narcotics are not things that any one country does in isolation. So that you know, with a, a a Mali that has sorted itself out and can be a partner to its neighbors, a partner to the international community, to the longer term, inherently regional work of those issues. That is the general framework, if you will. Um, on which we approached uh, this construct. I think, too, you know, you talk about the unhelpful actors in the North and, and pernicious liaisons. I think a big part of the peace process, in particular its implementation, goes very much to the essential question of uh, not only reuniting Mali as a whole, uh, but also delineating between the people who support the state from people who spurn it, which is basically the difference between someone who chooses to participate in a construct of a Malian state and those who, uh, you know, are, are, are doing um, uh, pernicious activities that, in fact, in, uh, would prefer for there not to be a greater control of the space. So that's that's a very that's a very important winnowing out um, as you go forward into the implementation. And now, Joel, you'll be talking a lot about some of our OTI programs, and I would caution you all that although we are very proud of some of the, of the contributions that we made towards helping Mali get back towards elections, toward doing some very grassroots kinds of efforts, as well as some larger overarching efforts to provide fodder to support this process, we are not here to say, you know, um, there's no banner behind us that says victory or, you know, game, game over. Um, once you have a peace process, indeed, you still have to implement it. So Mali still has an awful lot of work to do, and it is not a time for complacency, uh, because the, the great gains uh, on, in governance, the great gains in return of stability are not um, there forever. Um, they are, they are, it is possible to threaten them, and it is only in continuing on that road um, that, that, that you, you can have a prayer of, of, of counteracting that. And it's something, although the <laughs> implementation of the peace process is very certainly a matter between Malians, the experience of these last three years reminds us that the security of Mali has more to do um, with just Mali and their relationships with each other. It was something that threatened the larger stability of the Sahel and, I, and by implication, international security. So the, that is the basis on which we all, besides the fact that you know, there are many faces in here that I've also seen in Mali, anyone who has been there immediately falls in love with the place and so wants it to succeed, uh, but this is not only only about a story of Malians. This is a story about larger regional security. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, um, so we're very pleased to be here uh, to talk about the Mali program, uh, and we're very grateful to USIP for hosting this event. I think it's a fantastic event. Uh, I used to be a fellow, I myself used to be a fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and the Bush Institute, and used to, you know, I attended a lot of these events, and I, I think they're very important. I think they help improve the transparency of our policy making, and, and they deepen our democracy. These are debates that, we have, that, that are great to have. Um, as far as, for, for me here, I'm here to talk about our program, um, and what we did in Mali from the period of 2013 until uh, ending right now in 2016. 
OTI's uh, vision statement says we, <clears throat> we strive to be the preeminent U.S. government response to, to complex political crises. We want to be called upon in the hard places where difficult things are happening, where we can bring our unique set of skills as a small but important part of the whole of government response to tackle these challenges. Um, and I don't think political crises often get as complex as the crisis that happened in Mali. Uh, that both the ambassador and commissioner summed up so well. Coup, counter coup, rebellion, civil war, Al Qaeda, um, things went bad quick. Um, to help put the pieces back together, OTI was called and we responded. Um, ambassador Leonard uh, laid out excellently our policy responses uh, of what we were trying to achieve, um, what we in the international community felt needed to happen um, to uh, help her resume her place among the community democracies. Um, so, uh, as we said, we first set our eye on elections. So, helping the Malian people get an elected government back in place that we could interact with and that we could work with to solve the issues of security as well as issues of the, the Civil War. So, through 19 activities, we did things like sending 16 million text messages to every Malian cell phone multiple times, uh, informing people how to find their voting booths. Um, deployed technicians to the bigger voting centers, helping people uh, guide guide the voters to, their, to, to where they were going to vote. We organized. We worked with youth organizations on huge get out the vote efforts to add energy and momentum to the election process. Meetings in villages, civil society networks defending their votes. Uh, and there were good elections, four national level elections, uh, two rounds of both in a period of a few months. Um, and then we put that to bed and we focused on local and national reconciliation. Working to help communities in the north to overcome conflicts in areas that have been controlled by Al Qaeda showing momentum to recovery and peace through activities like community meetings, uh, cash for work programs, small infrastructure activities, uh, working extensively with culture, um, groups from, from groups such as the, the Timbuktu Renaissance uh, organization uh, to local groups like theater organizations, musicians, griots. Um, at the national level, a sophisticated youth network began to find their voice, uh, and we formed a great partnership with the Ministry of National Reconciliation. We worked with hundreds of remarkable partners to help make the case for peace and reconciliation heard nationwide. Um, and we worked to support the Algiers peace process, uh, translating and printing all of the documents from the Ouagadougou initial ones all the way through the ceasefire, all the way through the roadmap and to the final Algiers um, final signed agreement. Forums and communities discussing the contents of the accord and how they impacted the lives of private citizens in villages from Gao, Timbuktu, all the way through Sikasso, all the way down uh, Mopti. Um, radio debates, television programs, SMS blasts, uh, working with radio partners to send journalists to Algiers to, to cover the peace process in local languages and inform the communities and the populations of what was being discussed on their behalf. Uh, and finally, we worked to challenge the toxic ideas presented by Al-Qaeda during the time that they controlled the North. Uh, specifically, we did a pilot program in Gao, where certain communities had been enthusiastic about uh, the arrival of Al-Qaeda. Uh, we worked to help them reconcile, to come to terms with what had happened, think about why it was wrong, and help reinsert them into the fabric of Malian society that makes that country naturally resistant to violent extremism. Uh, over the three-year period, we did 238 activities or grants for more than $10 million, and the average grant size is about $45,000. Um, our partner, our remarkable partner in this endeavor um, was uh, the contractor who managed the task order. It was ACOM International Development, and, and they're here today. Um, that had three offices. We had an office in Timbuktu, in Gao, and in Bamako, uh, and 60, more than 60 staff working closely in the villages, and in areas where it was hard for us to get to areas of Timbuktu or Gao, working in the villages with the communities as we tried to deliver peace. Uh, it was a remarkable three years. Uh, and we were so very privileged to also have hundreds of incredible Malian counterparts from the very grassroots levels, councils and, and youth organizations, all the way through ministries. Um, and it was, uh, um, and, and was to work alongside them and help them defend their freedoms. Um, they brought up a little bit also uh, to address some of the lessons that we learned, because we always try to learn. We're actually here on an after action review, internalizing some of the lessons we learned over the last three years. Um, so I think that there's, a, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about three. Um, first of all, we were, uh, we were incredibly lucky to 
have remarkable policy guidance from the State Department and the, inter and the interagency um, coming from the embassy, uh, from Ambassador Leonard as well as Ambassador Holmesby. Um, and we figured out together what needs to be done. Uh, and, then go, and then figuring out how to go about and advance those policy imperatives in the villages and in the communities. Um, the lesson there is in policy vacuums or where things are unclear, OTF programs struggle. Um, and, and we did not, so that was good. The second, um, and we talk about this all the time at OTI, you have to have programs that are quick enough to seize windows of opportunity as they emerge. Something is happening, you must respond. Um, in Mali, the quickest grant that we did was, I think it was about three hours. Um, the quickest cluster of activities that you'll see here responding to a return of conflict when the Prime Minister visited Kidal was in about a week and a half. Uh, and, and you have to be quick um, and flexible to pivot the program when political imperatives change. Um, and third, and I can't stress this enough because this is hard, you have to be willing to take risks. Political transition programs are complex, they're tricky, uh, and being successful requires you to take hard issues, uh, sometimes with imperfect information. Uh, and you have to be willing to fail if you're gonna be able to succeed. And that's not easy. Um, and this is one of the reasons we do small grants. If something doesn't work, uh, the risks are reduced because individual projects, they can be changed, they can be terminated, and we can find out what does work and power forward without affecting the initiative as a whole. Um, so those are the three things that I, that, that I think that we've learned from the Mali program. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is a great turnout uh, as we have a discussion about our policy in a, in a faraway land that we all love. Right. Well, uh, geez, um, there's so many questions and so much to work with here. So um, I wanted to open it up. Oh, sorry. Um, we have some folks that have mics uh, that can bring to you. Yes, please. Thank you, um, thank you for the presentation. My name is Corinne I head up Human Rights Office for West Africa, and I know. Could you could you wait for the mic sure, for sorry. one second? Thank you. Got a loud voice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Corinne Dufka. I head up Human Rights Watch's work in West Africa and have been to Mali many times, most recently in December. Um, so my question is, when looking at the issues that gave rise to, I guess, what we could refer to as Mali's spectacular and very painful collapse in 2013, we, and I'm sure many of you, recognize a few of them. Um, key issues, corruption and bad economic governance being one. The other one, impunity, and the other one, um, uh, the criminalization of the state, notably uh, in drug trafficking. My question is really, um, if you think that A, Mali has recognized those issues uh, enough and whether um, the international community, um, including the US government, is um, addressing those issues both programmatically, rhetorically, and otherwise. I mention this because I was just in Mali in December doing research on the spread of war, the very unfortunate spread of violence, at least, and the growth of, um, of extremist groups into central and southern Mali. And I spoke with a lot of leaders from the Pul community, particularly, and they mentioned again and again and again that their boys were joining these groups, particularly because of the lack of justice, the security vacuum, um, and ongoing abuses that, uh, that, that these extremist groups were, were exploiting uh, in order to recruit. So okay. thank, thank you, you very much. Let's hear from the panel. I can quickly begin. Okay. I, just maybe one one uh, quick answer is that well, it's well has Mali recognized these issues? Of course, um, I think that's uh, that's a given. However, I think it's important as in the international community to understand that you can't really deal with these issues. Uh, in three days and then send a report saying, well, we've been successful. I think that uh, a long-term approach is really what needs to happen and uh, it's really unfair to ask for results, I think, within you know, a very short period of time. But I think that, I mean, the issues are quite un well understood and um, really what has happened in, in 2012 has contributed to uh, Malians within Mali and outside of Mali uh, to really spend time in, in understanding what what is happening in the country. I, I would say that, um, you know, when I think of well, how did this all go so very wrong, there are three categories of things for me. 
um, the three sort of fatal elements. And the biggest one that is specific to Mali as opposed to perhaps coming in from elsewhere uh, would be, you know, these delightful people who took their best characteristics to too far of an extreme to an extent that became corrosive. And I mean in particular, you know, Malians are the nicest, most consensual people on the planet, and all those wonderful uh, mechanisms for diffusing conflicts uh, became um, uh, an unwillingness to uh, engage in the constructive criticism that is so important to a democracy. And I think that part of it was not a matter of policy, but a side product of policy. Uh, you know, Atete coming to power after uh, uh, what was then viewed in Mali, of course they had not seen a more recent American standard, of a very sharp uh, domestic political discourse, um, eschewed uh, uh, membership in a political party because the, the, the atmosphere had become so poisonous. But that's, you know, in looking at the former IMF representative, that's like saying in, in economics, okay, if you're going to intervene in your currency, you can lean against the wind, but you can't push with it. Um, and by, by stressing consensus, that turned out to be ultimately corrosive and allowed corruption to creep in and allowed the hollowing out of institutions, which made a lot of Malians mad. But in fine Malian fashion, rather than talking about that or confronting that, people were just sort of grumbling about it. So when the coup finally happened, everybody could say, yeah, and I'm really mad about that, and I'm really mad about that too. And one of the things that I love so much now seeing in Mali, but I think drives our, our consensual, consensually uh, bent Malians a, a bit to distraction, is a, a very critical debate about what is happening. And you know, I'm no longer the ambassador to Mali, and I'm not here to either defend or condemn any Malian leader, but I think it's great that people are asking hard questions and, and bringing their government to account. Um, and that's exactly what Mali needed and did not have that was a big part uh, of bringing it to where it was today. The other two, FYI, <laughs> are just the, um, you know, also a, a, a victim of a, a a victim. You know, the the, the post-Libya, the, the Tuaregs who came back to Mali were people who were either born there or left Mali in the 1970s. So therefore, significantly, had never reconciled themselves to any of the intervening uh, peace agreements with the Tuaregs, and so came back as a well-oiled fighting force looking for uh, something to do and finding a, a ready new generation of uh, Tuareg descent to glom onto. Um, and then I think the other factor that absolutely cannot be underestimated is that the encroaching extremism in Mali created another power dynamic beyond sort of rebellion or traditional hierarchy as paths to success and prominence and power. Uh, so the idea of uh, Tuareg extremists is making that deal with the devil uh, to allow AQIM to come in. Um, and furthermore, those two streams of Tuareg rebellion, not necessarily cooperating with each other, but kind of happening at the same time, uh, was all the more difficult uh, for a, a hollowed uh, out set of institutions to counter and, and has an lot of explanatory uh, uh, value in this context and all the more reason to go back up that spiral uh, to be able to address those problems in turn. Yeah, um, I think I'd just sort of reiterate exactly what, what was already said. I mean, the, the, the point of the peace deal is you have to figure out what to do with these armies that are standing against the government. They have to, there has to be a DDR process. They have to figure out a way to weed out the, the political fighting from the extremism, and then you can focus, and the Mali military and the, and the international forces can focus specifically on uh, improving themselves and reorganizing themselves and addressing these challenges that are not new challenges and are not going anywhere. So. Um, it's it's part of this is this is the next phase and and they and it's gonna it's gonna be a lot of work and it's not easy it's gonna be slow but um, but there is you know there are slowly but surely baby steps. Okay, I have a gentleman in the back. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Christos Kiru from the Center for International Relations. Um, now, there are certain things that, that have changed in the narrative of the conflict over time. And one of the tendencies that we see is the understatement of the role of the, uh, of the jihadists in what happened in, uh, in 2012. Now, the, uh, the Tuareg were not defeated by the French or the Malian army. They were defeated by the uh, Ansardin, the jihadists, in the Battle of Gao. And that's something to remember. Not only that, but also uh, since then, uh, the Tuaregs have been good allies uh, to the French force in pursuing the war against terrorism, against the jihadists. So these are interesting dynamics that we need to remember. Um, so 
Why is this important? Because the al Qaeda of the Maghreb, as you very well mentioned, um, as ambassador, uh, have been playing that role of steering uh, ethnic groups against uh, the South, against Bamako. And this is not just um, with the uh, Tuareg, it's with the Fulani, it's with other groups that have been marginalized because of the drought, because of the corruption, and all the other problems in Mali. And so the, uh, the question here is, because we talked about disarmament of the rebels before we start the process, why is this so important? We haven't done it in Colombia, we haven't done it in Northern Ireland. The political process began far after, uh, far before the rebel groups disarmed. And if you like, with the example of the elections in 2013, well, the Tuareg did a pretty good job in withdrawing to allow the elections to take place, even though they held their arms. So why are we stuck with this issue while uh, as we procrastinate in the peace process, we have this uh, continuous bleeding of former um, Tuareg and Arab and other uh, insurgents towards the jihadist movements that are increasingly becoming connected not to the al Qaeda of the Maghreb, but to ISIS and other intruders in the region, you know, connecting through Boko Haram in Nigeria and so on. Why is it such an important issue to disarm the, the rebels before the political process takes off? Thank you. Who wants to uh, start? No, because I've had some very long discussions oh, with Dr. Okay. Kibu. <laughs> say simply, clearly it isn't that important because that process has gone a very, not, it is ultimately important to accomplish, but I think that what we have just described is the, fa the fact that the process has gone a very long way without that yet being fully accomplished. Um, so it is one of the things that needs to happen, and I think that the contested status of, of Kidal and the complications that that brings on so many levels for, for governance and security uh, and, and um, service delivery. Uh, how do you have, you know, the disagreement about you know, moving to uh, lower forms of elections shows that it ultimately has to be accomplished. And at the end of the day, as I said earlier, you have to get the people who are willing to be with the state, not spurn the state, um, and, and, and act together so that you can tackle these longer term issues. I think that's where I would go with that comment. And I would also say that uh, nobody really, people didn't necessarily defeat anybody in the north of Mali. You know, people sort of maybe walked in after uh, uh, movement of people. But it is, it is striking to think about the how small the loss of life was uh, to change control of that vast of a territory. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, fair enough. Uh, the, I think the issue is, so we were all, I mean, a lot of us were there when uh, Prime Minister Musamar went to Kidal um, on a trip, and uh, we saw just how quickly the situation degenerated back into what we thought was actually going to be a lot worse than it was, and thankfully things were calmed down. Um, and I think that that's just an example. When you have different, when you have armies that are holding guns against each other, that are not one to the same, not even, it's, it's just, as, as has been mentioned here before, it, the, the likely of going back into conflict within five years is, is exponential when there's not a process. And it's not about, you know, there, there, there's all sorts of great ways to do this. And like you mentioned a bunch of examples, there's a whole bunch, there's, you know, there's local police groups or there's local protection organizations or there's reintegration into the Malian military. There's a whole, and these are discussions that, that the Malians need to have and figure this out, but they have to figure out how to, how to bring together one chain of command so that they can then go after the bad guys. Because uh, it's getting the security situation, and we all saw the Radisson, the, 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 the terrorist situation is getting worse and, and it needs to be addressed in short order. Okay, please. Can we have a mic, please? Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Chanak Livali, and I'm, I'm the uh, ambassador of Mali to the United States. Okay. Well, uh, I cannot but uh, start by uh, thanking the American people for uh, all what you're doing for my country. I want to thank President Barack Obama for his decision to have the American forces help the French forces during the uh, Operation Serval, and uh, the American forces are today again helping the Barkhan, helping MINUSMA to help Mali get out of uh, the crisis we have. And uh, well, since I have been uh, in office here, I have been really very, very much impressed um, 
of the generosity of the American people. Just look at all of those people who come here and uh, just because that you all love Mali and Mali loves you. <laughs> um, well, I think nobody uh, expects uh, me of uh, saying um, uh, many things uh, bad about the, the way the government is doing things today. <laughs> and I will not say that. <laughs> what, I, what I will say is that, um, uh, well, the, uh, the job is not, is not totally done yet. We are very grateful to the international community for all what has been done. Uh, on the multilateral basis, on the bilateral basis. Um, the MISMA, which was African, became MINISMA, and uh, Jack, uh, like what I just said, uh, the French uh, government, the American government, all the world uh, has helped Mali and is going, keeping doing it. Just I heard in the news just a few days ago that the uh, 600 uh, German soldiers will go to, uh, to Mali. So. A lot has been done, but a lot remains. Um, you know that the uh, peace agreement was uh, signed in May and June of last year, and that there is uh, an implementation uh, procedure, uh, which is uh, uh, in which the government is helped. The government and the former rebels are helped by the international community. Exactly those who were with us in Alger, that is, all the neighbors of Mali, African Union, European Union, United Nations, uh, the French and the U.S. government said that they are not member of the committee, but still were there as observers. And um, uh, we need, we need that this system continue, that this system continues. During the negotiations, uh, at many times, the negotiations have started in July of 2014, and uh, well, they did not end before the 20th of uh, uh, 28th of February 2015. So it's uh, from July to February. It has been very long, and uh, it has been necessary many times to put pressure. Um, I think uh, that uh, there has been much more pressure on the government than on the rebels, and that is, I think, that is a normal way of doing things. When there is a rebellion and there are peace talks, then, um, well, the party which is supposed to be the, the strongest, which was not the case this time, yeah. but anyway, the government is always considered as stronger than the, the rebels. So the government is the one uh, which have suffered more pressure from the international community. And I think President Ibrahim Bouakar Keita did accept the pressures. He did accept the peace agreement. Uh, he accepted into the negotiation things with which everybody, not everybody in Mali agreed. That the reason why the president had to send his ministers out in the country to explain the peace agreement. When you say negotiations, you mean that you have to give up something to get something else. And the president did accept many, many, many things. Um, a few days ago, because the uh, implementation of the peace process was slowing down, the, the president, the prime minister first, and the president have had talks with the leaders of the rebellions, and uh, I think things are back again on track. They have decided that a meeting uh, will be held in Kidal by the end of this month. Uh, a two-month um, action plan has been decided. So uh, I, I think the, the peace process will really uh, uh, come back on track and things will go. Uh, now, about all the, the, the um, governance issues, the, the corruption issues, uh, nobody uh, uh, refuses that those things exist. Uh, I think President Atete, uh, before he, uh, he was uh, 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 overthrown, uh, has decided to uh, appoint uh, a, a special uh, high officer in, against the corruption, and the man he had to organize a conference, national conference against corruption was the man who is prime minister today. 
And the President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita <coughs> has decided, has decreed that year, the year 2014 was the year against corruption. I'm not saying that uh, uh, neither one of them has succeeded, but I'm saying that uh, yes, they are aware uh, that corruption is one of the worst things happening today in Mali, and they, that the president knows that things will not work with the corruption going on. Is uh, but then, uh, well, uh, the time has happened the past where there existed much, much, much less corruption in Mali than it, there is, it is today. So it means that if the peace agreement is correctly implemented, then uh, the, uh, the management of the country, I think, will come back into a normal way. Uh, my uh, conclusion is, then is, uh, but by what I started with, that is, uh, a lot has been done, but the job is not over. So please, help us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Before we, go, before we go to the next question, I just, I just have to say one short thing, which is that it is a, a, a fondly held tenet of Malian culture to tease those who are very close to you. So I just cannot resist, Mr. Ambassador, to say that uh, when I spoke with Malian rebel groups, me of only pressuring them too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one in the back. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Modibo Dambele. I'm a journalist at uh, America. Mm -hmm. Originally, I'm from Mali, but I'm here today as a journalist. <laughs> so before I uh, ask my question, I just have a general observation about what's going on right now in Mali. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know this since uh, the signing of uh, the peace deal. Uh, Timbuktu, Gao, you know, the Malian government has full control over those regions. And but we notice one thing that the spread out of insecurity almost from the north to everywhere in the country. We have killing on a daily basis. And uh, right now the most dangerous stuff is the rise of a religious extremism. And also a lot of people, many, many people left Mali and they went to the neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. And my question is, Yes, I know the U.S. Uh, embassy in Mali have translated the peace agreement in Bambara and uh, many other languages. But what is happening in Mali, we have three major issues, illiteracy, mm -hmm. poverty, and the youth unemployment. You can translate, for instance, a text in uh, Tuareg or in Bambara, and it is not easy for people who have not learned like uh, the alphabet to read it. So my question is, what U.S. is doing to help especially like uh, the return of those million of refugees. Right now also we know, we notice that we have a lot of people especially discussing like those tribal leaders. We, we have signed a peace, but it's like the real authors, they were not there. So what U.S. is planning to help like the return of those refugees and also to fully implement the Malian government because still now the Malian government is not present in Kidal. Mm -hmm. And we have like uh, the, uh, those uh, rebel groups, MNLA, you can name all of them. Every day there is killing. And the most dangerous things, Mali is almost 80 to 95 percent a Muslim countries. And we notice like uh, the rise of uh, the intolerance among Christians, uh, Muslim, so what, you, what, what is the, the course of action that the U.S. is planning to do in order to tackle all of those issues? Because somebody who doesn't have a job, if you do, even you don't want to join like uh, those uh, religious groups, sometimes they give them money. Mm -hmm. So what is U.S. is planning to do? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would love for Joel to talk about some of the particular reconciliation activities, but going back to, <laughs> I don't want to repeat the same thing all over, but um, going back to my point about reversing the spiral, you know, when there was a coup in Mali, the U.S. government, as a matter of legislation, not, as well as policy, um, is, is forced to um, uh, stop certain types of assistance, uh, among which education, among which that was non-humanitarian in nature. Uh, and so, indeed, as, as we talk about, we talked about the need to get back to an, a democratically elected government, it's because many governments, and not only mine, uh, find it difficult
difficult to work with the government in that circumstances on the full range of issues that we have been working to address um, some of the very pressing needs of, of education and services uh, to which you referred. Um, so I think that that's part of the reversal of the spiral story. Um, I think that the implementation of the peace process is also a huge part of the story about uh, uh, fixing the anomaly of uh, the, the Kadal outlier, because that is the most contentious place uh, for, for those discussions because of its demographic profile. Uh, but I would love to hear Joel talk yeah. about some of the reconciliation activities that we were doing and for which there are some uh, follow-on yeah. uh, programs through USAID to continue. Yeah, so um, good questions. Uh, one. You know, you're absolutely right about literacy, which is a huge problem. We actually put the, we used extensively radio, understanding this issue, extensively radio across the country in local languages, um, including reading the accord in local languages on the radio to, uh, to be able to reach folks. Um, so uh, I think that, so a couple, couple of issues here. The first is that, um, you know, OTI was, is, a, is an office that responds to political crises. A lot of the issues that you uh, have, have rightly addressed are chronic problems of poverty. Um, and so, on the first hand, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to think, with peace, if you look at the, the Malian economy in 20, end of 2012, 2013, was down to about $10 billion. It, it grew by 30% over the next couple of years because of stability. Peace and stability bring economic growth, and there's where the Malian economy is going to be able to then create the, the windfalls necessary to be able to invest in education and invest in literacy um, as a country. Uh, without depending on the donors, but we all know that's a long ways away. The the second issue is um, the USAID program, and, and unfortunately the USAID mission director could not be here today with us, but the USAID mission is a, is a large mission with, with large offices of education, economic growth uh, that um, are, have been working uh, in the South and that require a certain amount of, 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 of security, of stability to be able to implement long-term development programs in the North, which is why we need a peace deal and which is then why we need to be able to challenge some of these, um, some of these terrorist organizations too. So it's all a bit of a, you know, it's, 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 like, a, it's like dominoes. Um, but they're still there they're, and, they will, and the U.S. government will remain committed to development in, in Mali, you know, for, for you know, generation. Um, the, uh, but specifically as far as the, the implementation of the peace deal, so one of the ways that, that, that OTI works in missions with embassies and with USAID missions is we, we are there for a, to be catalytic at a particular moment in time. We worked very closely with the mission to design a mechanism that the mission will be running to help with the countering extremism and implementing the peace deal. And that's going to be run out of the democracy office in the mission, uh, and it's actually going to be implemented as well by AACOM International Development. So we're not losing the DNA, as our director likes to say, the DNA of, of what we did um, over the last three years will remain impregnated in the follow-on program that will continue to challenge these issues. But my, my final point is, we love to help. You know, this is, it's, we believe in this work. But at the end of the day, these are Malian issues, and we will help as much as we possibly can, but it's for the Malian government and the Malian people to, to, to fix these things in the long term. Uh, maybe just to piggyback on what he just said, yes, these are Malian issues, and because these are Malian issues, uh, what we at the NET do is really support uh, initiatives that come from Malians. We're not an implementer. Uh, we fund programs that civil society groups present to us. So there are a few that are currently working um, in northern Mali, but also throughout the country, um, to explain um, the content of the peace agreement in, in different languages, Bamra, Songhai, uh, Bubu, all of these uh, um, uh, languages to uh, local groups. But our financial capabilities are not comparable to that of uh, USAID or OTI. So um, I guess we yeah. will probably yeah, achieve some results uh, over the next uh, few years, but uh, we don't have as much money as we do. Always comes down to money. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go back here. And then we'll come Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your elaboration and uh, sharing what you know about Mali. My name is Amadou Maiga. I'm from Mali. Uh, I was born in Mali and I grew up in Mali. I just came in the U.S. Uh, on March uh, as a Hubert Humphrey Fellow. I'm a student at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So thank you so much. Uh, as over uh, official Malians official said uh, they need help. I'm talking about uh, 
Mali, my experience is the hardship uh, that we experienced in 2012 in Mali. Uh, as Malian talking, Malian citizen simply, uh, what uh, normal at grassroots level uh, people uh, think the perception that uh, uh, normal Malian have nowadays is that uh, there is kind of a cohabitation uh, because this crisis is a kind of a result of a failure of international policy because uh, the crisis in Mali uh, causes, we have uh, uh, internal causes and external causes. Uh, so what people think like now is like a, a peace agreement signing it doesn't mean peace, real peace. Real peace is what we build uh, as community. Uh, when I look at uh, uh, during my work experiences as a humanitarian worker and peace builder, uh, there is kind of a, a challenge that this uh, 2012 crisis rise in Mali. Uh, we have uh, extreme violences that we are talking about today uh, is due to uh, extreme poverty. If really uh, this country need real peace, we need to uh, invest in uh, real uh, economical growth and uh, economical uh, economical production activities to keep young men uh, expecting to, ha ha to have hope, uh, such as uh, some part, I'm talking about uh, big challenges rising uh, uh, since uh, the 2012 uh, crisis happened in Mali, is like uh, we are a community, we are, we are uh, in, as Malian, we are uh, all the civilization. Our society is built like uh, you c diversity. It's a real di diversity, but uh, today uh, it's like uh, some part of population is feeling uh, as victims. We have a kind of victimization of a part of say, uh, ethnic groups, and some are, this can be really and intended uh, uh, consequences uh, of uh, international policy intervention. So thank uh, and you and, and, and welcome to America. Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> Do you, would you like to pose a question? Yes. Okay. Nowadays, what's the, uh, what is the effectiveness of, uh, uh, of uh, international intervention for building peace? Because we have so many challenges that uh, okay. uh, it looks like uh, people are more focusing on political process uh, then not uh, tackling uh, the deep root causes of this crisis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I can, I can take that. Okay. So, um, and this is where the ambassador mentioned some of our reconciliation activities. Actually, one, we, um, and, and, it, and it will continue and it needs to continue. Um, you know, Mali created the Ministry of National Reconciliation, a new ministry, to, to address exactly these issues and the realization that there had been ethnic conflicts that were exacerbated during, the, during, during, this, during this, this period that need to be addressed. Um, and they're doing work as a new ministry, and we worked a lot with them very closely, and it was a great relationship. Um, but at the, at the grassroots level, we did, I mean, Dozens, if not hundreds, of local level discussions, and every and as you know, every every challenge was different. At one point, it's the pole community that had a that had a conflict with the Tuareg. Sometimes it was the white Tuareg against the black Tuareg. Some, sometimes it was the Bozo against. And every and every situation was unique. When Al Qaeda came through. They, they identified very quickly what the conflicts were and made them worse. So when we got there, the, this, this rich fabric of, of society, which makes Mali resilient for, as you mentioned, a thousand years, um, was fraying or was frayed by this, by this occupation that, that, that the, 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 especially the northerners, considered unprecedented. Strangers, foreigners came in. So we... Um, we began to work, and like I said, through a bunch of our activities, and we're not, you know, and we just did it, we did it for, to demonstrate the possibility of doing it, and then to show that it was, that, that there was a way using and, and collaborating with Malian culture to, to, to jumpstart this process, and it continues today. When you look at the discussions that happened in Adifis, when you look at all of these different local level, the, the Ministry of Reconciliation's tour along the Niger, where they stop village by village by village and talk to the local leader. This, this is something that, um, that, you know, the, uh, that USAID will continue to support, but that the Malians themselves are, are, are beginning the process of doing, and I think that it's, it's healthy and it's, it, it's important. 
board up here? Uh, my name is Jordan Ryan. I'm the Vice President of the Peace Program at the Carter Center, and I want to thank uh, USAIP, and I'm very glad that uh, the ambassador uh, from Mali here as Minister of Health is coming uh, to Atlanta um, in part to talk about the Guinea Worm Program. As many of you know, President Carter said that his fondest hope is to stay along, uh, alive long enough to see uh, the last Guinea Worm die. There are five cases in 2015 in Mali, uh, and we all know uh, with um, conflict, um, comes the, you know, the inability to really uh, get to some of the villages where um, those last remaining guinea worms are. And it's in that context that I'd like to ask um, both these, you know, I think tremendous discussion here um, uh, from those that have really been on the ground and looking at, at how to both sort of kickstart peace, the lessons learned about speed and effectiveness, about bringing people involved. But then to hear the ambassador say, um, well, the end of the month, we hope to have a conference, and we're working on the peace implementation over the next couple of months. It would be interesting to hear both from those sort of outside observers, as well as perhaps the ambassador, where are the real impediments? What really has to be done in terms of both the very short-term action of the next couple of months that can really step up the implementation um, of the peace accord. Obviously, it will be the long term that matters uh, of changing the dynamics of making sure of involvement, but are there things that need to be done quickly um, to make sure that there's a continued momentum uh, of implementation of the peace agreement? And we certainly see the link between peace and health and look forward to see you in Atlanta next week um, because we want to make sure that last guinea worm uh, dies very quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. The ambassador wish to Yes, would you like? Mm -hmm. Can you? So the, uh, the, the peace agreement says that uh, all the combatants uh, should go into ca cantonment, and then that, that is the GDR, the demobilization, uh, hello. Demilitarization. <laughs> Demilitarization. <laughs> the, DDR. They know, so they know DDR. DDR. The DDR. Everybody, everybody knows what the DDR, DDR is. <laughs> and the, uh, the decrees have been taken, and all the uh, the armed groups actually have given the list of their, their soldiers to the MINISMA. So what has to be done in the coming days is to, to implement that. So the, the MINISMA should give, be a given either the, uh, the, uh, the, the means or the instructions uh, to, go, to go ahead. Uh, another thing that has to be done, and that is the most important today, is to stop the terrorism. You know that uh, after the, uh, the French Operation uh, Serval, uh, we thought that the terrorists are out of the country, that the, after the Ouagadougou, uh, uh, the 18th of June 2013 agreement was signed, the elections were uh, undertaken, and uh, the next was just to, uh, to go ahead with the uh, negotiations. And then the jihadists came, and they started attacking. They, at the beginning, they were only attacking in the north. But then, uh, now, every other day, you would hear that they have made an attack in the north, in the center, in the south, in the north, in the center, in the south. And then they attacked in Bamako. What they want, what they want, the terrorists, is that uh, while Mali's partners would be afraid to go to Mali, they don't want you to like Mali. I, I hope they won't convince you. You will keep on loving Mali, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's, um, so uh, the, the fight against terrorism is today the, uh, the, the priority of the priorities. Yeah. And like I was uh, saying, a lot has been done. The, the United States government, the president has decided to, be, to have Mali into the SGI, the Security Government in Initiative. Uh, just a few days ago, I was at the State Department. I have heard uh, uh, much more uh, good news from, from them. And I know that the implementation of all of that will help us get rid of the terrorists. And once we, that is done, then the three billion euros that have been pledged at the uh, uh, October 22nd conference in OECD in Paris, that is enough money uh, when it is all invested in, in the North. The USAID has a five-year program, very a lot of money, and most of it will be invested in the North. So, the, the, um, the uh, commitment of President Keita 
to implement the peace process and to have the peace process, the implementation will uh, help the north of the Mali catch up on the, uh, the, uh, the development delay that the north has uh, on the south. Everybody agrees on that. Uh, no, but then what do we do so that the north will catch up? So once the terrorism is out, the peace will be in and the corruption will stop and the governance, governance will be good and Mali will become the paradise it has been, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Um, I'm gonna take uh, this lovely woman here and then go to the back. <laughs> and in the yellow. First the yellow. Oh no, right behind you. Can we just do this first? Thank you, she's been waiting. <laughs> We'll hand it to you next. Hi, uh, my name is Aisa Tatiam. I'm uh, from Mali, and I'm really thankful. I feel the love in this room. I want to thank everybody for uh, showing so much interest in, in Mali and our problems. I do have a, a comment and a question. The comment is about the globalization of this thing. I know we have problems in Mali because the, the DEA uh, uh, fight against drugs in the United States and elsewhere made it so that we became the, leak, the weakest link for the drug traffickers to come in the north of Mali and do their things. So I do think that all of us should feel responsible for what's happening right now in Mali. The second question or comment that I have is that uh, the diaspora's role is very important. I know most of the time uh, USAID and most of the international partner are talking directly to the government. But I do know that we as diaspora, we love our country, we have resources, we have expertise, we have competencies, and we love all of the people here to see how we can build together strategic partnership and coalition so that all of the things that are happening are coordinated. The resources are there. We just need to make sure they're well coordinated and they make some impact in that. Thank you again. <laughs> Her question was much better than mine, but uh, <laughs> just to follow up about uh, other issues. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Redali Amouri, I'm a Malian lover. Uh, I'm an independent <laughs> consultant on the Sahel and especially in Mali. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is in regard to um, instability in the North and the reasons why peace accord doesn't succeed. Uh, when, when I follow Mali and I see the names signing the accords, it makes me upset, especially what that I follow the country. It, it, that's why the accord doesn't ex succeed. When we talk about the enemies discussions, when I see the accord, who signed the accord, names are that have been involved in um, illicit activities, not known to be involved in illicit activities, yet they're still, they, they have participated in previous accords in 2000s and the 90s, and yet they're still being involved despite the failure of the accord. So what are what the Malian government and its partners doing to pressure um, pressure those personal those individuals or other uh, communities to sideline them and uh, to move forward and prevent from falling from the same same problem? Uh, second question to Joel directly about the we know that North one of the issues is division among communities between the Tuareg Arabs Songhai Pearl. So what OTI has done, some of the success stories that you have, you, you can share with us about to, to bring those communities together. Thank okay. you. Okay, so I'm gonna ask our panel to take this opportunity perhaps to provide um, an answer to this gentleman's questions, but also to give some concluding comments. And we'll end with, we'll end with Joel. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so maybe my concluding comments will uh, address the issue of the diaspora, which uh, I consider myself a part of the Malian diaspora because I do have a Malian passport in addition to an American passport. And I'm also the vice president of the Association um, des Maliens de Washington, D.C. Uh, the Malian Association of Washington, D.C. And I think that, um, and I think I, I mentioned that in my comments, 
the contribution that the diaspora, the Malian diaspora, um, uh, has currently in, in Mali is, is much bigger than it has been before. And that is because we are paying attention to what is happening. We want to be involved in solving uh, the problems of Mali. We want to be on panels, and we want to talk about uh, uh, what we think are the main um, issues uh, in Mali. So um, we're really hoping um, that this trend continues, um, that uh, the, the Mali program at VOA will continue to come to uh, events as, it, at the, as they relate to, to Mali and the, and the Sahel. And um, uh, I, I work with the NED, at the NED. Um, I started the Mali program at the NED. But, for example, um, I, this is my first time to meet Joel in D.C. We've only met uh, in Bamako before. So we do. We are coordinating efforts. Uh, I'm doing it because it is my job, but I'm also doing it because Mali is very close to my heart, and um, uh, because it is my country. I would say that um, uh, as a as a as a top line thing to finish with that democracy succeed the best with when their citizens are active, uh, when they are requiring of their government, when they are committed, and when they are engaged. And that stands for Malians, whether they be within Mali or, or here in the United States. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, Malians as a people have great tools to succeed in this endeavor. And there is an enormous, yes, it is a, a crisis that had both internal and external elements to it. There is also an enormous international community commitment to help Malians succeed. And we want them to, not only for themselves, but for the larger security of all their neighbors. Um, yeah, so just to, to answer that question real quick, um, you know, one of, the, we, one of the things we worked a lot on was, was this reconciliation, because you're right, there was just one of the, it's one of the things that, that comes to the fore whenever you talk to anybody. Um, and every, it's all context specific, but you know, a lot of, and there's a lot of good examples, and I'll give you a couple of stories, but um, watching, uh, watching a, uh, we, we supported a rally or a gathering in Gao. Um, filled the stadium, three, four thousand people in Gao. This is when the rebels had refused to initial the peace deal. And uh, a, a, a Tuareg, a Temeshek leader um, from a different clan stood up and gave this on, on ORTM, his first time to be able to address the nation, probably, and stood up on ORTM, talked directly to the rebel leadership and said, we're the same people, we're the, we have the same history, we have the same past, we have the same future, we have the same blood. Uh, we need you to come on, to, to return to us. Um, and to stop, stop opposing this. And this wasn't from a minister, and this wasn't from, this was from someone who probably never had an opportunity. Giving people at the, at the very, the people who were affected by the conflict, who lived the crisis, the opportunity to speak out. That's where OTI, that's where I, that's, that's the work that we do. And that's the powerful uh, ability that we have to, to give people, to, to give voice to the voiceless. And I think that another example, we did a big concert, uh, it was a theater competition in, in Timbuktu. And one of the participants said, the French gave me back my country, but this competition gave me back my town. And those types of things, you know, they, they say, now I can I stand beside an Arab and I can stand beside a, and, and we can be together again. Um, and there's a lot of examples because we did so many activities, but you're absolutely right. And we hope, we're, we're, our idea is to be catalytic. So we hope that it continues. We hope that we've, we've worked with great Malian local folks to demonstrate that it can be done and, and show them that, that, that there's people who care about this. Um, and now it, it's, it, it's upon them to continue. And uh, so just for my last, um, you know, I really, it, it was remarkable to watch how Mali recovered. Uh, this, you look at other countries that, that fall into these deep, deep ditches, these deep, and they can't, they can't crawl themselves out, they can't pull themselves out, they get stuck. Uh, and Mali did not get stuck. It, it has decided that it is going to overcome this. Uh, and now we have terrorism, we have, you know, the Radisson, and we have, and, 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 and implementation of, and one step, but one step, you know, and, uh, this, the African adage, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. And it was a remarkable opportunity for us to participate, at least in a small way in that. Thank you. And thank you to USAID. Yes, so ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you. I want to thank USAID, OTI, for coming to us with an idea to hold this event. Um, and I think that uh, we're very happy that we were able to partner with them. I want to thank our, our amazing panel, and I want to thank all of you who I, I hope will continue to help. Uh, you must continue, actually, uh, to help Molly. So thank you so much. Thank you.